straight out of the T dot. That's what it is. Live from the six boroughs. Don't, don't go nowhere. For sure. Welcome to Standing in the Six with, with, with your host, Michael and Constantine. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to a wonderful, beautiful episode of Standing in the Six. I'm very excited uh, today, Mike. I am too, just because it's the afternoon and you said good morning. And but the reason why I said that is because <laughs> the audience would have never known that, but now they know. That but now a, they know. Now we know. But anyways. Thank uh, you for clarification. <laughs> good morning. I'm always here to help. Yes. You. So today, uh, um, I, I would like to uh, introduce um, a very special guest to the show and uh, mm-hmm. someone that... Um, I mean, I would say I would call a life changer. Yeah. Uh, a life changer. Uh, today, we are talking about Mr. Stephen H. Somerville. Um, Whoa, middle initial. Actually, that's not middle his middle name. Actually, M, but that's <laughs> okay. fine. I'm not going to tell him. Okay. <laughs> I, I just thought it'd be funny to throw an initial in there. You just but made no, no, it up. But, uh, no, but I'd like to. 100%. Good morning to you, too. <laughs> uh, Mr. Steve Somerville. And uh, Steve, um, I mean, has. First of all, like, who is Steve? We always say this. Who is Steve, right? Yes. Who, uh, who is Steve, Mike? I'm going to put you on the spot right now to Ooh. see how much Mike actually knows as a D personality. That's another story. We're all Ds. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> to me, Steve is a D, someone yes. who represents and embodies a standard. What I love about Steve and it's true love is that he's unafraid. That You are rare because most people live a life of quiet, mere, a mere existence, afraid of just... You know what's going to happen next what what's what, should i say something like and, and being a police officer former police officer former detective you've seen a lot and for you to come out of that and still be someone who speaks to the highest standard in terms of personal safety which we'll go into a little bit more mm-hmm. you you to me again are a rarity because you're willing to take the arrows that would be thrust in your direction for speaking up oh, thank you sir you humble me yeah and, and i mean at the core of that it's so easy to turn a blind eye in a society where it makes sense if you're selfish and just trying to self-preserve you're about making sure people are safe which means that's that you lose at least your reputation maybe you're not safe even amongst police and i mean that in the most humble way yeah yeah, yeah. we were just speaking to a journalist today from a very popular probably one of canada's most popular newspapers and uh we as you know we have an upcoming training session here at home base at sentinel mm-hmm. and the uh, media personality should have came out participating in a training day to compare the standards to what we do and how we do it compared to the current law enforcement standards and it's gonna be interesting to hear her opinion at the end of that yeah mm. amazing now yeah. i spoke to the man maybe you can share some light on what he actually does yes well <laughs> your Steve, test steven somerville was a <laughs> staff sergeant with the toronto police for 31 years was it well just actually just shy of 25 it was 24 20, years 24 years in july of 2000 just a couple of months before september 11. yeah yeah. And how many of those years did you, did you train uh, well over 15,000 police officers if my, at Seal Big College? Yeah, I actually did some training in multiple sites during my tenure as a police officer, um, going back as a constable, actually. As okay. a constable, we were provided an opportunity to train at the Seal Big College. That's okay. the Toronto Police College. Right. I was uh, fortunate enough, or somebody had a sense of humor, they promoted me whilst I was a constable within that element. And um, throughout uh, various avenues in policing, was able to return to what we called our public order unit at the time, right? Which became morphed into the public safety unit. So it had a capacity there to be able to train on-duty officers for riot teams and crowd disturbances and not. And then uh, just before that, I was able yesterday to go to the officer safety section at mm-hmm. the police college in Toronto. That morphed into another opportunity where I was able to attend the Ontario Police College. This is common or a trainer on loan, if you will. And uh, that was my dream. That was my dream job, my dream gig, to be able to work with, right from the get-go, right from the start, before perhaps people have uh, are tarnished or perhaps before they're tainted, if you will. Right. To get out there and meet people right from right from the beginning of that development. Right. And that is where I was able to wrap my career in July of uh, 2000 at the Interior Police College. Now, when Steve, when you said that he's police, yes. for all those listening, okay, that may not like cops out there, I'm talking to my family members, guys, he's different. Okay, <laughs> great. And <laughs> sorry. Um, a little more. I think yeah, there's a little so more. Sure. Well, well, Allow me to interject. Yes. Yeah. To my policing friends out there, these guys are different. They're not the wannabes. Okay. Right. Oh, and, hey, and they're nice. not the people that are trying to pretend and how they be in a uniform. And I think when you've had the benefit of working from both sides of the fence, you can really see what's important from either side. And yes. So it's a pleasure to sit here with you guys because you are certainly different in how you perceive, how you respond, and what your vision is. Yeah, well, that's awesome, Steve. Appreciate that. So to add to this 
I mean, this plethora, as we like to say, of, of resume. Plethora. Um, plethora. Uh, uh, stay safe, uh, which is going to be something that we're going to focus on a little bit later on. Um, what I want to do is go back to the 90s, hmm. okay? Um, for a lot of us, we were just, I mean, sounds well, Mike, like a, you, were, like a good you, were, you were a young boy back yeah, in the 90s. Back in the 90s. Yeah. I mean, I'm saying young boy as I if I'm this old guy. Uh, <laughs> I mean, we're all young here. Yeah. Uh, but I want to go back to the 90s because there's something that happened that changed a lot of the thinking around, um, I guess, training for security. Um, I could be throwing the dates off wrong. Okay, as a disclaimer to everybody, dates, names, I will probably mess up. But uh, not to be a mind reader, but you're probably speaking or referencing the Patrick Shand inquest. Yes, which will take you a decade further. It was actually in the '90s. Yes, and it was um, a situation with a shoplifting incident in Scarborough, in Toronto, okay. in the Toronto area, where a shoplifter was viewed selecting product, baby food, and left the store without making an attempt to pay for the concealed item. And for our loss prevention professional friends out there, that's the essential description of what uh, shoplifting would be. Mm -hmm. He was apprehended. He was arrested outside that store by a meat manager and a produce manager. Now, unbeknownst to the law boss staff, Mr. Shan had just consumed two hits of crack cocaine before he went into the into the store. Mm -hmm. And when he came out and the, being exposed to the potential for arrest, he started the fight or flight and there was one time during that process, including a hired security guard for the company at the time, which is no longer in mm -hmm. business, called Wackenhut. Mm -hmm. They had physically took Mr. Shan down to the ground. And during that time, you heard Mr. Shan yell out, I can't breathe. Mm. And he was resisting, or was he trying to struggle for the last breath? Uh, make a long story short, was the fact that he unfortunately succumbed to that arrest process. He died. And the front page newspaper headlines the next day captured the essence of man stealing baby food dies by apprehension. This led to a coroner's inquest. And coroner's inquest, just for those that are not informed of it, that is essentially an investigation for the deaf, for the dead. That's where we are a voice for the dead. And we want to find out, it's not a legal standing, but it's a public inquiry to find out, is there anything we could do within our culture, recognizing that human life is the most precious commodity that we have. And took it one step further to the point where the inquest wanted to view security. Security, because this was as a result of a citizen's arrest. And should citizens, should general members of the public who earn a living in protection of assets or property, should they have basic training, basic skills? And being a little wordy, I apologize for that. But what the scope of the corner was at the time is that I think the public should know should have a good idea as to what restraint training is all about. Now, at that time, I had just left the, the uh, Toronto Police, my tenure at the Interior Police College. And at the time, I was making for a, uh, working for a major uh, TV company. It was no longer a business. It was Chum Television at the time. Mm -hmm. And I was approached by the coroner. The coroner soft said, uh, we'd like to retain you. We'd like you to speak to the jury. We'd like you to educate the jury. And, by the way, line up, which I did for a couple of days, to be taking questions by people who had standing at that inquest. To summarize it, that jury came out with 22 recommendations, all speaking to health and safety, and essentially saying for the first time in our culture, security should be licensed. They should be trained. Oh, oh, wow. Because at that time, wow. the existing standard did not exist up until 2005 in this mm -hmm. province. You did not need to be licensed. There was no reasonable uh, expectation of what people should do. So as a result of the death of one, we've morphed into a, a culture now where you receive relevant training, the duty of care, and recognizing some of the pitfalls associated to human restraint. And the jury's recommendations at the time, there was a liberal minority government in the province. They acted on it. It was called Bill 159. And they mandated mandatory security training and licensing to start to covering off some of those, those areas. Why? To prevent an unnecessary death and to make certain people are aware of the limits to holding a person down. So... For the technical minded who are looking at this podcast to say, well, what was the training? Well, mandatory training to understand that the words positional asphyxia, how we are all belly breathers and being held down against your will, uh, can cause a person to die. And also excited delirium, a drug psychosis, especially mm -hmm. when a person consumes cocaine, and how that can change a person's world uh, in, a, in a blink. Wow. So I, re I was retained. I testified at that coroner's inquest. And it was interesting because uh, I was almost by the moment I finished, an idea I'd never really thought of before was I was approached by a major security company saying, wow, you intrigued us today. You're 
last couple of days your testimony has resonated with us. Would you be interested? Would you be available for hire to take a look at our security training? And most importantly, would you provide the basis for restraint training for a security company? And you could say around that time, around that day, that launched the company now known as Stay Safe. Wow. And what's so remarkable about this, Steve, is that it's actually kind of shifted the culture, I mean, at least in Ontario, for, I mean, security to be on the track of this is a bare requirement of what you need to get on. Now, the bare requirement to get on and to get your license now these days is 40 hours. Correct. Okay? And uh, I think we can all agree here that, um, you know, that, that's the most simplistic element of, uh, of, of what you need to actually get something on the job done. Right? Yes, it's basic. Yeah, it's very basic. Basic entry level, if yes. you will. And we yep. also know, and by the way, just as a side note for those, Steve, continue this career uh, uh, which has now uh, uh, set him up as an expert witness right now in not just the realms of security, but things that happen in law enforcement on a regular, regular basis. Uh, I mean, Steve, uh, we talked about this earlier today, but um, you basically have your calendar full. I mean, with all yeah, this. Yeah, life has really taken, you know, I'm very humbled. I sit here in front of you today living within a pandemic culture, and where so many good people have lost their opportunity for employment. Um, Constantly, I'm never been busier in my life. Mm -hmm. I have over 40 ongoing files with respect to litigation or criminal matters. I've got a significant number of trials booked up. And as we sit here today, in 18 days, I'll be flying back out to Edmonton, Alberta. And I will be a defense witness for an Edmonton police officer that's been criminally charged in the matter that went very viral online. I, I think we actually showed, looked at the video earlier today. Yes. It's very well seen out in Alberta. And I will be a defense witness for that officer to hopefully allow a jury to see it perhaps through different eyes and to take some different considerations forward. Okay. So, I mean, go ahead, Mike. I was going to ask you, so you know, it's actually, when you're in court and you have to speak to these things, how do you how do you approach it? How do you approach knowing that your words could sway the defense, it could sway the jury? Okay. Um, Good question, yeah. Mike. Um, it's not that I speak in a manner in such a way to sway a jury. I have a duty to the court. Mm -hmm. I have an obligation to the court. I'm nonpartisan. I don't take sides. And uh, probably a poor choice of words. I'm not a hired gun. Mm -hmm. uh, it's probably a little alarmist to use that. But I don't get it with an agenda. I tell the truth under oath. That's extremely important to me. And I'm able to, under uh, my background, convince the court that I have requisite skills to be able to aid a jury or aid a trier of fact, a justice or a judge to be able to understand the components associated with this case. Because generally speaking, you need to be qualified as an expert to be able to show that it's just not common theory that you don't need to tell a person what they already already know. Mm -hmm. So in circumstances, uh, rare circumstances, where an individual has perhaps more experience than a judge or a jury, under that set of circumstances, you're permitted to testify within an um, identified scope. And you're allowed to speak to a certain manner with certain information to assist a jury to come to a decision. I've been able to do that now, sir, in four provinces and one territory throughout this country. And, um, yeah, it's interesting. So under that, you could speak to a matter of training or an actual application of force. And I'm able to compare that to the years that I've trained a similar environment or how people are trained and how people are expected to remember. And are these circumstances, not that they'll ever make that decision whether what they did was right or wrong, I can say that and speak to him under oath that it was reasonable within the circumstances and would it be consistent with the training that they would have received. Okay, now you've been doing this for decades now, essentially, and it's become common language now. Black Lives Matter, all the things that's happening yes, with George indeed. Floyd, who uttered the exact same words. Yes, sir. I can't breathe. Yes, sir. What's your take on this? I know. Wow. I'm, yeah, <laughs> like literally because, I mean, I feel privileged to be able to ask that of you because everyone yeah. is trying to make sense of it. People have been talking about this nonstop. Yeah, the pandemic has kind of taken its seat, but that doesn't mean that these problems still aren't there. There's so many takes, you know, all these things, defining the police. There's there's so many opinions. Okay, so uh, with your seat, you know, how, how, did, how, how, how have you computed? This is your world. Yeah. This is what you speak to and to see everyone paying attention to it. What needs to happen and, and what are you seeing? I've, I've been asked that question a number of times uh, by friends, colleagues, family members, never in a public process. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. I it's apologize. A, <laughs> no, it's a probing question. Good for you. And I'll remember that later. Yeah. But <laughs> they, I'm very concerned with perception. Mm -hmm. And I think one word, and I'll preface it, is to worth my response, is empathy. And trying to understand what another person is going through when you're trying to deal with that person. And at times, what impacts or interferes with my ability to deal with you could be cultural. It could be a language-based area. Mm -hmm. And it could be perception of fear 
compared to resistance. So I think people who are wearing a uniform, let's preface in that way, when I'm dealing with an individual that I perceive that their behavior requires physical engagement, you've got to stop and you've got to think down here and you've got to take the reasonable steps to calm this person down. Now that serves through your body language, what I say to you, how I say it, and keeping in mind that I need to take these steps to perhaps prevent the need to apply force. I believe those are areas that somewhat lack currently in our law enforcement training. It's not black or white, and I'm, I'm saying with respect to the Black Lives Matter, but it's very gray, very murky world we live in. And mm -hmm. we need to take a very strong look at the type of curriculum that, we, that we've been taught and what we place as being relevant and what we place our relevance on. And I believe, sir, there's not enough emphasis placed in de-escalation skills training and role-playing and scenario-based training to give the officers or people wearing uniforms the experience and the confidence to realize that a lot of times I am able to talk you down without having lay of the hands. Because I lay my hands and you, sir, life changes for everybody, especially when the situation goes awry. You know what, Get me. I want to interject there. Empathy. I mean, very loaded word. You know, it means a lot. Um, we, I think, generally have empathy for someone like George Floyd. Even someone who's just busy in their day, they see it. it there was something about it, you know, to, and uh, for lack of a better word, it arrested you in your day. I had to pay attention to it. Everyone had to pay attention. I know my kids, they're talking about it in their class at the time when it happened. And um, I want to switch it, so, uh, you know, switch it to the other side. Empathy to the police officer. Now, forget that scenario. I just mean generally. Yeah. To understand what is a, what, because you deal with this directly. You go in. You see it on the on the on the back end where they're being, you know, a police officer is being criminally charged, thinking that he was doing his or her job. Right. Right. Th that divide. That's alarming. You know, like when you really think about it, like uh, there's a lot of people now that are shaking their fists saying, "Oh yeah, man, that's not justice." They should, but they actually at sometimes thinks they're doing their job. Okay. So yeah, that's I, true. And let, let me ask, what's going on? This is my question. To be empathetic to the police officer who at any moment is responding to a call. And they don't know if they're going home themselves because they're still a person. Give us insight into that. Well, sure. Good. Another good question. Um, like, what is it? What does a police well, officer I think go like to? to like, I think, to re if I may say, I'd like to respond to just globally. There's a lot of medical definitions or very, you know, difficult definitions. What is empathy? Is putting yourself in the other person's shoes, mm -hmm. trying to understand what they're going through, and how would you like to be treated within similar circumstances? I think if you view that as a priority. And uh, you approach a situation, a confrontation, that individuals arguing or fighting, if you try to view what's this person going through and try to identify that and try to manage yourself, your own fear, your own anxiety. And keeping in mind, I'm not suggesting law enforcement has this, but there are some righteous individuals who feel they're absolutely correct. And there's nothing you can tell me. It's black or I've asked you once and it's over. You know, that's not consistent, sir, with people who are struggling with issues of social and mental health. Mm -hmm. Emotion crisis, fear, anger, intoxication, sobriety issues. We'd see use of force applications where we need to take a look at two things here. Was it reasonable and was it necessary? Mm -hmm. What other options did you have? And usually I defer to those other options would be take a deep breath, all sides, and try to understand. And barking orders or raising my voice or yelling at you, that doesn't work. That honestly goodness doesn't work. We say honest to God, but I want to remove the religious connotation yes. to it. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't work. It's trying to resonate with you, trying to trying to relate to you, trying to get that relatability, regardless of our skin color, regarding our, our ethnic differences, and trying to be something that you need at that time, keeping in mind, I'm here to help you, not hurt you. And I think if there's more training associated to that and the relevance and importance of that, you're probably aware the city of Toronto right now is just about to engage as we sit here today. There's going to be a pilot project for emergency crisis workers to respond to a lot of uh, wellness checks where police officers will not be given that task, unless there's violence being recognized. But you're going to have clinicians, you're going to have social workers, you're going to have professional people who are geared to talk to you and calm things down. And I think that is probably the avenue. We need to look for other avenues. It's not how tactically trained you are, how fit you are. It's not how apt you are with your handcuffs, your baton, or self-defense measures. It's how apt you are with your, your mouth, your tongue, and your willingness willingness to use it okay mm -hmm. so with that empathy it's putting yourself in their shoes yes, it's sir. easy for a civilian to put themselves in another civilian's shoes yes to me effective empathy means it's it's to all parties 
it, that includes if it's going to really be an empathetic situation, which means that it would probably have the best outcome if we approached it this way. That also now extends to the cop. It and, does. And, and I say that, like, what does a cop go through? And I think, that, oh. I, I think that's the part that people don't think. They've never been in a vehicle, see a vehicle go across three lanes and think, oh, I got to pull that person over. You're right. And it's tinted. And it's a huge vehicle, and it looks like there's five people in there. And like, and then, you know, I've had a very difficult shift compound into my eleventh hour. And yeah, and, yeah, I, and I say that because the people like, I might be treading on where people don't care to give empath- empathy toward the police officer. Well, but certainly, people, our audience will be pro police or opposing police. We get that, and yes. you have a right to view it however you wish. I respect that, but thank you for bringing that up because policing is not easy. It's really not, and I've had almost two and a half decades of working that side of the streets. You see, on my business, my business number used to be nine one one. Oh, that's a great line. You know, <laughs> never and, heard that before. You know, it's not always giving your business card, but mine was nine one one. And people invite you to their world when there's problems, not because things are going great or we're having a good barbecue, like you to pop by for a second for a, for a burger. No, there's some crisis, some calamity. So you go there, and often you don't know what you're responding to. A lot of times, policing encounters, if you want to reference it of that, is spontaneous. It's not pre-planned. You haven't had the benefit of hindsight to understand what it is you're going to. It's literally very limited information, and you get there, and things are unfolding in front of you at such a rapid speed. It's very, very hard to distinguish what's occurring and what would be a reasonable response. And with respect to uh, to your own personal safety and your own personal risk, you also have to factor that. You can't put your own personal safety at risk. In the case another person might be attacking you, I mean, you, you can't drop the ball and you must be remain vigilant, but there's a combination between vigilance and empathy. Yes. And where's that balance lie, right? And it's different, because I'm gonna suggest that with the three of us, gentlemen, uh, our definition of risk is different. It's probably based on where you were raised, what you've seen, the experience you've had of a child as an adult. And we come from different cultures, three of us, three different men here at this, at this table come from different cultures. So, and I do know through having created a friendship with you, Mike, uh, you've shared with me a lot with your youth and your background. Mm-hmm. I've not been exposed to that through, through my, my, my youth. And probably, uh, I say this, so embarrassing, a lot of white privilege I've been exposed to. Mm-hmm. And I really didn't recognize that until just a few years ago. Mm-hmm. And I say that out of honesty, not embarrassment, mm-hmm. uh, not bragging rights, but it's different. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you take that for granted. So when we try to compare notes and how we respond to it, um, you come in with a lot of street skills, street smarts, that's not taught to you at a policing environment because you know what it's like to be fearful of a street and encounter and how to size people up and respond to people and things like that. Can I thrust it back to training, police training? Is there an element of training that covers the dynamic of some of the, you know, marginalized neighborhoods, Uh, the, the, you know, we say things like you know training with uh, to handle mental health. Yes. And there's all these like broad themes. Right. Do this. Do do police colleges go in depth though to give you at least a basic understanding that if this family in this neighborhood and it's single, you know, you know, single parent, right? Um, some of these kids grow up around crime. Some of them they they don't have the etiquette and refinement of like what we, again that some might be privileged and mm-hmm. that privilege extends beyond race. It could be anyone. Agreed. Right. Okay. Agreed. And uh, just is there anything like that that pr- arms uh, a police officer to put themselves in the shoes of the general public in order to properly police them? Yeah, g- again, good question. Because um, you're I, making a habit out of this. Good yeah. question. So <laughs> here's the thing. Um, when you go to the Interior Police College, it's right now as we speak a 12-week program. Mm-hmm. I don't know if the public generally understands the volumes of material that you have to get through. Yeah, that, sound, that sounds short. I didn't They're know short. it was only 12 it's weeks. It's 12 weeks. Now, there is pre-training, there's post-training, and there's life skills training. Okay. Ideally, you get the basic training to cover off the basis so you can go back to your home service. When I say your home service, the police service that's hired you. Right. Retain you. That is where the true learning starts. That's where you go with a coach officer, a training officer, a skilled officer, senior officer. And you start learning, uh, I want to say the ropes. It sounds a little bit crude. But you start learning the basis and how to talk, how to approach. Now, that's dependent upon the officer's experience and good, bad, or indifferent, right, and how we respond to it and where you apply those skill sets. There's different segments of our community that you really do need to adjust your mannerisms. 
And I'm not saying whether that would be in a, in a social dynamic environment, but there are some people that will not take kindly to being spoken to in a certain way, and others uh, would, would, would require certain language to make it more consistent to their, their needs. Mm -hmm. But we used to, when I say used to back in the day, I've had experiences in dealing with um, man, you know, managing people with mental health issues, and you have members of the community coming in who are living with and dealing with mental health, and they share with you examples. They share with you examples on how they've been either treated well or treated poorly by people wearing uniforms. And they add that to your skill sets and your repertoire and your thinking. That's I powerful. Call, I do your duty belt. And to recognize, here's what I need from you. And here's what I need from you. And abuse and shouting at me and hurting me or scaring me or threatening me is not going to work. And we're, now we have a lot of people within our community who are, you've heard the, the, the lines, defund the police. They're not actually talking about literally removing police budget. I don't think so. I think what they're trying to suggest is there's other segments of our community that need more funding to be able to manage these areas of dealing with issues where things are going around, like home visits for or wild visits for policing. Yes. So it's interesting, and I've said this a few years ago. So community needs beyond oh, policing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But it's kind of interesting. At first, I will be honest with you, I took offense to it when I was first told that a hospital or a clinician or nurses would have a better means of de-escalating and calming people down than me. And I thought, what are you talking about? I'm a cop. I'm the best, mm -hmm. right? But then I started hearing their curriculum and material, and I thought to myself, never thought of that. That would work. What's, what's some things that they kind of threw out there or just kind uh, of general verbiage, approach? Verbiage, positioning, hand gestures, um, creating that rapport with the person. I'm not saying creating a friendship, but creating that rapport. Um, having it's, it's, to me again, it sounds like tools because they don't have a well, badge. They don't have a badge. They don't have a gun. And they to don't use. have nine one one. They don't have a baton to use. Exactly. And they're not given those physical skills components that, at times, when people are at risk or perceived risk, you defer to. But what they do look at trigger words, things that say I'm going to hurt you, I'm going to assault you. That's not the time to put up hands. Uh, that's the time to perhaps put out a different verbal. And I found a number of clinicians, certain ones I've worked with, and I had the pleasure a few years ago doing a. Uh, a presentation on a mental health symposium, go figure, in Ottawa, mm -hmm. at Royal Ottawa Hospital, and listening to clinicians speak, and they really resonate and gravitated to my program, the Stay Safe program, and I thought, wow, that's that's unique. I wasn't counting on that, because we gave them a little bit of a, a tweak in terms of the, some of the way we see it, and you know, for our viewers, they may not be aware of, you guys are specialists at what you do in, in healthcare, including a very, very busy you know hospital here in, in Toronto, and making the difference by talking to people, being proactive with people. And that's the essence of what we're talking about. So for those that have read the books called Verbal Judo, you know, and there's a brilliant book out right now, Talking, Talking with Strangers by Malcolm Gladwell. I would mm -hmm. ask people to check that out. Talk about communications, the power of communications. And if a person has ever misunderstood you, or if you've ever had to correct a person, or if you've ever misread a person, that's the factors of communication and how they fail us. So here's the big thing I've learned, is that if you are showing signs of resistance, it also might be showing signs of fear. And I need to put the fear factor out of you. I'm not here to hurt you. And once I do that, you see people's body language change. You see people's hands start to lower. And you see people go from a closed fist to an open fist. Yes. And at that point, I'm like, I realize I've done my job. Now, is there any training to help police recognize the fear that they will have? Because I'm going to throw it out there. Police can police terrified. They can get called into a situation. Oh. I see these videos. To me, it's so black and white to me knowing the street dynamic, that that cop's terrified right now. Absolutely. The way that they're looking left and right, they see cars pulling up, people filming. They literally, they don't know what's going to happen. They don't, they don't know. know if it's a lead pipe to the back of the head. That's they right. don't know if this guy's buddies and cousins and are, like, You're they right. have no clue. So is there any training to identify and to say, like, you know what, you are police. It's okay to be afraid. You are going to be afraid. And is there any dialogue on that? Or is it just to get the job done? No, that would be harsh. There certainly is discussions, and there's training modules with respect to the perception of fear and being calm yourself and how to calm yourself. And even um, we talk about autogenic breathing principles, how to lower your breathing rate, get your heart rate down, get your blood pressure down, try to recognize that if you're a fearful person, you're in the fight or flight mode, you need to be more you know, conversant and whatnot. So yes, sir, that training does exist. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, I don't believe it's taught to the level of being your priority base for your training. It seems the things, it currently, as I understand it in this, in this country, just not this province, the things that are prioritized, such as your firearms and your use of force tools, are used less mm -hmm. than what we use every day, which is the communications tools. But there's less training focus in communication skills than there is on the, the areas of uh, physical force. Mm -hmm. So when we start to swap that paradigm, 
and adjust the paradigm, I think you're going to see a change in the policing culture to recognize that we need more conversant and we need to be more communicative and I need to be able to resonate my words with you and vice versa so we don't even have to go go there to the physicality aspect. I, I, I love like, I'm thinking right now because I know these neighborhoods and cops come in usually in uniform if they do visit, okay? Sometimes it's with a film shoot and it's all done as like, hey, we're going to have a barbecue. Hey, we're going to... Okay, everyone plays the part, right? Yes, yes. Kids come up, they get hot dogs, balloons, and whatever. That's right. To, but from the, from the ground, though, it would be really interesting to maybe entertain even a program. We should even maybe talk about this with Ron Chinzer and to take cops and to let them walk certain neighborhoods or to experience the streets as not police. Right. Right, and to maybe meet some certain people, individuals, youth, mothers, and to like literally face-to-face field uh, what they think of policemen or police women, right. right? You know what I mean? Like you've touched on one thing, Mike, too, yeah. with the uniform. And uh, I'll, I'll mean to ask you a question, please. Yeah. What do you think, generally speaking, a police uniform represents to the community? <laughs> it depends who you ask. Thank you. It depends who you ask. And what would you think would be the different responses depending on that segment? I can tell you right here. I might yeah. have let you know this before. We had fitted a guy in a bulletproof vest. Okay? Right. And he was trying on uniform. He was tactically dressed in, in this uniform. We had two ladies that work adjacent from us on our floor come out the elevator, and we flagged them down. I won't say their names, but we called both of them, and we said, hey, what do you guys think of this uniform? What do you, what do you think as soon as you see this guy in uniform? Not police uniform. This is a generic tactical uniform. Okay. First response is, but maybe maybe give a little description who the two ladies... I will get there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. First, uh, feedback one from the first lady said, I'm, I'm terrified. It terrifies me. And I said, why? Based on my experience, I don't know, just... And she didn't really go into it, but seeing someone in a tactical uniform made her terrified. Her co-worker, who they know each other for years, almost looked at her sideways, and this is... Uh, the second lady said and looked at her and said, what? Ter- what do you mean? I feel safe. She says, when I see that, I feel safe. That means that, okay, so background. First lady is, uh, she's black. Second lady was white. Hmm. First lady has had personal experience related to uniform that was very negative. Hence why it unearthed this. Just at the sight of someone that she's never met before, she felt terrified at seeing the uniform. Second one, her husband's military. Right. Her father's, like, like you know. Mm-hmm. And Used to that uniform presence. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. And um, it's, that is, to me, just without even trying to, we weren't trying to probe it at all. I mean, we were by saying, what do you think of it? We were actually asking, not for the sake of these very real responses. It was more about the aesthetic. Exactly. We were literally yeah. like, yeah. it was more just like, you know, what do you think? How does it look? And, right. and this was their very real, genuine response. Mm-hmm. So the response was not what you were quite looking no. for? No, but polar opposites. Though. Oh, this is the thing I always found was that uh, the uniform can create usually two areas, um, fear or comfort. That's interesting. And just by your presence. And so what does your presence indicate? So... At times, people look at you and think, I'm going to be abused, I'm going to be hurt. And others think, thank goodness you're here. I'm safe. Mm. So right from the get-go, from the moment you're recognized through that uniform, it can change the entire midst. A person can cross their arms, mm-hmm. either as a means of defiance or concern, mm-hmm. or it can create open up a pathway to, to communication. So I think that's something that I wasn't really aware of coming into policing, is how my impact, how people can predetermine my response merely by what does it represent to them? Like an instant trigger just yeah. without even knowing it. Yeah. yeah, and I think it's useful. So that's why it's great at times when you can take off the cap, the forage cap, and or the ball cap for policing, and <laughs> smile, and talk to people. And it's like a first impression, how powerful a first impression is. Mm-hmm. So with a greeting, a greeting, hello, how are you? And it be sincere, be sincere. It can really, really just arm a person's viewpoints mm-hmm. and make them more comfortable to talk to you. Are police trained to use their name when they say hello? Are they are they told to refrain from it? No, my understanding is through what's called a first contact approach. Is yeah, I'll we'll try to I'll try to say perhaps some constable Somerville or Steve, that sort of thing. Try to create yeah. that bond. So it wouldn't be frowned upon. So no. if I were to come into a very sticky domestic scenario, and I'm police, and I said, look, yeah. I'm, hey my, my, name, my name's Michael. Hi, Mike. Okay, yeah. I'm here to make sure. Okay. What a great way to f- you know really de-escalate. Yeah. Well, I mean, when we talk about training, we've said the word training quite a bit. Yes, sir. And uh, the one thing to, to kind of throw it here 
is that, uh, I mean, you built a, an incredible program that I'm going to speak from experience called Stay Safe. So um, a little bit about us, uh, how we brought Stay Safe into our lives. Is that, uh, <laughs> I like yeah, that. Yeah, That's yeah. A good. <laughs> is that, um, you know, just like the pandemic, as we brought up, has hit many, many uh, people. Um, I mean, it didn't really, like the pandemic was what kind of was the, 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 the ignition, I guess, to kind of get things going. But we've recognized as a, as a security entity that, 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 that training in our country sucks. I mean, I'm sorry to be that hard, <laughs> but but that that's how it is. And 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 you know, for what we do and what we represent, uh, as a, as a, maybe it may not be on the level of policing, but it's uh, you know very important in its role. It doesn't seem to transcribe with the individual that is performing that duty. And it's also very aware that many many entities and companies do not see. Maybe they see the value of training, but they just don't do it for reasons of cost and all. Right. Uh, for us, we recognized that very early on, but when we found out about Stay Safe, um, we were probably, um, I would say, guilty of saying that, you know what, we already do a lot of training, um, you know, internally, you know, we do uh, physical de-escalation, we do close protection, um, you know. Red carpet training. Yeah, red right. carpet training. Live, live events. Live events yeah, training. Events. But one of the things that, you know, uh, I think was completely overlooked on our end was the almost like the the, the mental state, the psychology, uh, the the level headedness of an individual dealing with the situation. Right now, right. typically for us, we we usually go above and beyond to hire people that are going to possess extreme communication skills. But, anyways, let's just kind of fast forward. The pandemic brought us in a situation where it blew away all the events, and uh, you know, right now we had yes. to put ourselves in a situation where we had to kind of pivot. And uh, our conversations dated very, very early on back in early 2020, Steve. Yes, that's right. Where we started to say, you know what? We need to start amping up this training. We already had sent some people to your course, Stay Safe, to be uh, train the trainers. Correct. That's right. So we had this, this like diamond that was kind of like hidden under the bed, not being pulled out to be showcased. So for us, uh, what, what it did was is it kind of reevaluated everything that we do and it changed the dynamic and the fibers of our thinking to be like, this is what is needed to take us to the next level. And that is to completely transform an individual with the training called Stay Safe. Now, for those of you who do not know what Stay Safe is, Stay Safe is a, is a uh, um, I would say, a five-day training uh, course that embodies everything from management of resistance behavior, effective communications, use of force, tactical, uh, sorry, handcuff, baton, sharp edge weapons, mm -hmm. just to name a few. That's okay. Right. And uh, I mean, we took that training and we completely embodied our people in that. And, and uh, in that training, uh, we were able to discover things. We were able to discover that, uh, you know, some of the things that we were doing may have not been showing out the best outcome in a situation should it have gone all the way there. Mm -hmm. And uh, then to, to make things even better, we started to identify in this training, which is kind of something that brand new kind of we kicked off in 2020 was the scenarios. Right, scenario-based training. Scenario-based training, right. which you actually take it now- from a classroom to put in a practical application and practice. That's right, we're that's Steve. Right. And we're gonna actually, I'm gonna cut some uh, videos into this oh, cool. so people can see, but this is where Steve uh, was able to, now after all our people have gone through this training, have been able to see now live, dealt with a situation where we had uh, live actors, real actors, I mean live literally, actors. Literally. Yeah. Working, real actors. Real working actors. Yeah, we're working yeah, actors. Shout out, shout out, Miguel. Yeah, that we're able to <laughs> now uh, put our people on the spot. And what we saw at the beginning of the scenarios uh, was, what would you call that, Mike? The, the, when you were to compare to what we first saw. Sloppy, hesitant, not confident, yes. lack of composure, not yes. sure what the outcome they wanted to have happen, not yes. sure what they would yeah. be applauded for or be reprimanded for. And they were basically trying to make it up so much so that they probably wouldn't even know their own name when they were, if you said, what's your name? They right. would have looked at you like, um, okay. And then when they did the training <laughs> and they went through the program, and then we did the scenarios again. It was like seeing two different people. Yeah, you yeah. saw complete growth. It yeah, was so complete that. growth. And uh, if I can just interject yes, go ahead, just from what Mike said, um, I don't think it's a question, sir, of people imploding or being incompetent. But the problem with just classroom work only or classroom training only, people get fooled or yeah, fooled into yes. thinking that they can apply that. Yes. You need a practical application because yeah. as you recall during our training, we've actually had good people, solid people, 
even in a training situation, turn to us and say, I don't know what to do. Mm. And to me, that's an epiphany. Yes. Right. To me, that's brilliant right. that we're able to give them requisite skills and a different means to apply their skills. And as you recall, we don't leave adults hanging. Right. What we gave them, and we said, okay, skip back on. Scenario back on, and then you were able to bring it to a very successful conclusion, and they got mm-hmm. so much out of it. I've been maybe so bold to say, probably more so than the classroom application, right? Because they actually got to apply it in situations as close to life as possible. That's right, that's right, and that's the difference. That's the difference where people get fooled and they get somewhat conned into thinking, Oh, yeah, I've, I've, I've taken a training program, I know what I know. Now it's time to practice it and apply it in a situation with a person who's an actor portraying a role. And to make it as close to real life as possible. And that's when you really start to apply the training and your ability, most importantly, to exercise judgment in a stressful situation. We also had some opportunities at times when people resisted you. Mm-hmm. And now, here's the thing. Um, you had to control people against their will and mm-hmm. not hurt them. Anyone can hurt people. Yes. The skill sets, and the true test is to be able to restrain you, detain you, and not hurt you. Right. And yeah. um, I'd like to say those classes that we're talking about did remarkably well. The higher Absolutely. caliber, higher standard there. Yes, sir. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and for us, Steve, I, I can tell you this. Um, any, any entity, any person listening to this right now, they need to understand just how, how, like, the, how transforming this is. We actually, right now as we speak, outside of our studio here, we have a, a Stay Safe program going on right now. And I actually yesterday spoke to some of the students who are our newest recruitment class, right. and I asked them, what's your thoughts so far? Because I'm always interested to see what their thoughts are. And they were like, mind blown, oh, wow. mind blown. And, um, you know, I'll just say for anyone listening, you know, for us as, as, a, as a company, you know. What we, did they say? Let me, I'm curious to ask. The thinking, the, 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 the philosophy, the, the, the way something is executed um, is, is for them like where it's, completely shifting their mind i never as you said you never thought about something the way it was perceived to you when it was perfect when that's correct it's the exact same thing that's happening right now so to me um the reality is this everyone uh training actually happens or it doesn't right and if it does happen most likely it's not happening the way it should be it should be presented it's not really doing anything for the individual that's the truth that's how it is right so so for me steve i can tell you as as a company who invested in our people to, to do this course, it paid off massive in dividends. I mean, we talk about Bitcoin, stay safe. Forget Bitcoin, stay safe. <laughs> because to me, I, I, I'll say, Steve, like, that, 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 that's what was able to happen to us as a, as a company. And I tell the story to people all the time because it just happened. Like this underdog story of a company called Senton that almost got wiped out because they built their company around events. COVID kicked in. We have right. to pivot. What do we do? And we basically gave it our all in this. And it yeah, wasn't, the program was the strength of the foundation of what we needed. But now we're in a whole new sector now. We're in healthcare right now. Right. And we could have not done this without Stay Safe Training for Steve. I thank you for that. Oh, thank mm-hmm. you. But I think it's also important. I'd like to find out how you came into the creation of saying, I need to put something together that literally is desperately needed out there. Oh, well, good question. Your turn. Good question. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, that took me back early, late 90s, early 2000s, uh, I started getting a request to do like self-defense seminars and, and whatnot. But what always used to drive me was, uh, respond as a police officer, was, uh, wow, the, the, the horror associated to people being assaulted and or hurt or being exposed to, to nasty situations where I used to think to myself, you know, with a little bit of training, a little bit of experience, that could have been prevented. And the tragedy that we're now dealing with, and you only have to go through the daily papers to recognize what I'm referencing, it may have been prevented. I mean, good people, you know, putting themselves in situations they really didn't recognize they're in their risk. The old, you don't know what you don't know sort of scenario. So start providing some training programs. And I'm not going to suggest for one second it was a copy and paste from law enforcement, although certainly there is some, you know, comparable standards. But I started to see there was a need. So the training wasn't only for just security companies. I've done a lot of that certainly throughout this country. But it was for uh, shelter groups, healthcare groups, things like that. And I remember the uh, response I had was remarkable. So in and around the area of having left policing in 2000, in and around the area of 2005, a business colleague, associate of mine, Frank Simone, um, we decided to start to put this into a business process. Instead of part-time, hanging out at the Youth the Odd course on weekends, what about a full-time gig? And it's more since then. 
Uh, it's really exploded. So but the basis of the program, it's, you know, you said five days. It's probably closer to 15 days. And um, just to take one step further, what Mike was talking about, the real growth of a individual is being exposed to the realness and the reality of what you deal with. So an event, a situation, being able to put it into action, filming it, mm. critiquing it, and then taking you through a court scenario, a scenario where now you're going to have to testify and maybe have some exposure to what it would be like to face scrutiny, face controversy. Maybe we call that cross-examination. And we were laughing about that earlier today. It was some people weren't prepared for that. Competent people, communicative people, mature people, good, good, solid core people that were not used to that scenario of now being having to critique and evaluate. And that is takes you from a quality product to an elite product, as far as I see it. And that's what differentiates you know, firms who are now say to you they're elite compared to the ones that actually are. Because they understand now what I need to do and how my documentation needs to unfold and what I need to say in the environment and Bob, my actions have to be consistent with the video or the CCTV or the cell phone footage. And I gotta be prepared to justify and articulate, you know, what I do. And I, I make a lot of people laugh sometimes. One of my taglines, my jokes is, in what you do in life, you have to CYA. And guys, girls, do you know what CYA means? And you usually get, well, cover your ass, cover your assets. No, <laughs> no, <laughs> it means, can you articulate? Mm. Can you explain? Give a sense of calm and reasonableness, you know, and what's in spontaneous response. And people, that's the aha moment of training. Steve, have you had people, have you had, do you know of uh, business firms, entities that have played Russian roulette with their business when it comes to lack of training with their employees that have put them in hot water? Oh, absolutely. And um, sidebar business that I do, I, I have quite a healthy expert witness and I do a number of areas. Uh, by the way, we're plaintiff defense. I work criminal matters, litigation matters. I worked uh, incidents involving plaintiffs and defense, certainly not a hard gun. But you start looking at the paperwork and the paper trail, which identifies deficiencies or liabilities. And you find out people that are working events and working gigs, um, overseeing safety and whatnot without training. Just the bare, bare limits and that they're being exposed to and expected to act in a chaotic world, a crazy world, without any reasonable sense of expectation because there's no training. There's no training provided to them in restraint and detention. That's some of the first questions I ask a prospective client. Does any of your guards, does any of your people, might there be a requirement for them to restrain a person or detain a person mm -hmm. and or ask a person to leave? If you've said yes to any of those three questions, can I see your policy? Can I see your procedure? And can I see the training that you provided adults and how to respond? What's your violence policy? And if someone rears around, raises their fists, what skill sets are you giving your employee and your staff members to reasonably respond for protection? protection from themselves and their assets and or other people. And usually at that moment, you get the deer in the headlights uh, or they've, they've, they've dropped the phone call because they're getting to areas that are painful. Because there are some people out there that feel that I can provide you a cheap product, consistent product with a, with a trained product. I don't accept that, sir. The liability factor speaks volumes to that. And you don't need to speak to any plaintiff counsel in this province who can very clearly talk to you about the, the cost for negligence and the cost for liability that haven't been factored with reasonable training to have people provide a reasonable response. I mean, like Steve, what I'm hearing today, and is that what, fair? You no, know, it's yeah. very fair. Absolutely. What I'm hearing today, and what we've experienced, and I, look, somebody might say this is kind of a, an unreasonable ask, but then to me, this is my answer to that. I think it should be just like there's these mandatory requirements now to have a license to carry the job of security. Yes. I think there should be a mandatory requirement to have this kind of training uh, for for someone to be able to execute their job. I mean. Why shouldn't it not? Why, like to me, like, like, I mean, again, what we're talking about here is like we're it's talking about protection of life and of asset, of premises, of environments. Right. So why is it that there should be no training for that? I mean, it's it's actually if you think about it, it's actually very distorted thinking. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, that yeah. What, so to me, my my two cents on this is that if someone's going to be walking into this industry. They need to look at everything. I mean, a lot of the, when I say Russian roulette, that's truly what's happening right now. We're going to take the chance where something's not going to probably happen mm -hmm. right, until it happens. And when it happens, guess who they're going to be calling? Well, you're throwing dice on a table. Right. And you hope it doesn't come up cat eyes. Right. Because right. then when it does, that's check. And what options do you have? And um, I'm not certain if there's going to be prospective clients or people out there kind of wondering what it is you teach and how you teach it. Here's a question I put to you. Um, <laughs> 
if you point of reference i'd ask you to talk about a government website that's the public service of health and safety association that's the educational wing of the ministry of labor i invite people to go on to that website and that's there again the educational wing of ministry of labor they have actually prepared a document on security provision and with that they ask you to talk about your training they ask you to view it and can you answer these these questions so the basis of your training does it have some form of expertise is your insurance to cover for that training, mm -hmm. right? Can you provide the background of the trainer? Where does that training package come from? Is it court defensible? Is it something that a person can speak to if it's challenged in the curriculum? Those are questions a lot of people want to back off. So if there's clients out there that want to hire a security company, um, you know, just not yours. Mm -hmm. What I'd ask them to say, okay, have you ever have requested proof of training? The security company, we'll call it ABC Security. Have you requested proof of their training? Should you be able to uh, visit and partake or view the type of training app? What proof of training does those guards have? Do they have a de-escalation program? If so, how so? If not, why not? So when you invest in a company and you think that all the risk is transferred because you hired ABC Security, you need to look at third-party liability because you're accountable for what you hire. You're accountable for the product you out there to work your event. And at the end of the day, you might have to justify and or articulate CYA as to why you went to the lesser scaled company to represent the safety for your colleagues, your, your needs, and, and, your, and your, the event that you're running. Mm. So you get what you pay for in life. I'm sorry, that, I hope that doesn't come across disingenuous. No, 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 that's a... Uh... And yeah, you can get security guards out there for probably 16 bucks an hour, all right? But what are you getting? Somewhere, somewhere. Right. Yeah, somewhere. <laughs> yeah. And what are you getting? What yes. are you honestly, reasonably getting? Right. What sense of accountability have you considered and looked at? So I ask those questions, and I guess it's easy for me to say that because I'm not hiring the security entities, but at the end of the day, when you take a look at appropriate security resources to exercise judgment, to not create a situation that's alarming, not newsworthy item, and to put reasonable steps in place and reasonable actions for people, that's ultimately what you're probably gonna wanna secure. Right, right. What's no. scary is to scale that up to where it matters, life and death, in, oh, yeah. in close protection. Mm -hmm. From what we know, the majority of, of people who hire close protection, because we offer it, they put total trust in the company. They uh, they don't know what the skill set is of that individual. They don't know what they don't know? Yeah. Um, and companies seem to be okay that clients don't even ask. They just, you know, they might say, like, I, I need someone. You know, obviously there's like, I mean, there's a lot of red carpet videos going on in the yes. background here. Yes. We're talk I'm talking real life right yeah, now. Yeah, that's right. Where someone says, I have an estranged husband. He's tried to kidnap my kids. He's actually, him and his brothers, who are, they're all looking. Uh, like, I mean, these, some people have some real problems. It might seem like that's far off there. There's other people that run companies, and because of the seat that they hold, uh, they're in danger of their life. That's right. If it's an oil company, and it doesn't matter, like, you know, that might be like a given. It could be as much as just, we found out that uh, a media company that we, have as a client their ceo gets death threats on the regular sure because there's passionate people that's right that pitch their media and their dream to be in and if it doesn't uh if it's not uh doesn't come to fruition that ceo is the person keeping me from my dream that's right okay mm -hmm. i got similar experience working with uh, live entertainment uh, live entertainment mobile uh being a, a national broadcaster where you had a lot of the hate mail and you had stalkers and people want to you know sort of follow your talent and try to create risk for your talent off off the site, going to parking garages, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So you've got to, and there's also been issues where family dispute, where you need to take reasonable steps to keep a family member that's in, you know, before the courts or whatever, keep them away from the workplace. If you don't have those policies and procedures in place and reasonable remedies for your staff, you've now allowed your staff and your, your, your clients to be exposed to risk. And that's yes. liability factor sure mm -hmm. that kicks in. Yeah. So I, I say that because, you know, again, if we test it at the highest level where it's where a protection agent's job is to keep someone alive. Yes, ultimately. These transactions of hiring and the money flowing, and they literally, it's only fortunate, and we hear this a lot in our circle, that they're only fortunate it was never tested. That's right. Nothing was, nothing happened. That's no right. one made an attempt. No one tried to, okay, because this is where you see what you have. And I think, you know, being from Canada, yes, we live in a safe environment. That's right. Okay. Well, Mike, uh, even take it back to the training that you guys did. If I, sorry, but it's my yeah. reference to that. And just not to promote only one company. I like to make this nonpartisan. But here's the thing. Your staff were exposed to some real-life issues. Uh, disputes, you know, d uh, domestic situations, mental health issues, 
issues of theft components, issues of trespass components, combinations of all the above where weapons were produced, sharp mm-hmm. weapons. False and accusations. Exactly. Stuff like that. In yeah. all these real-life situations, these scenarios were exposed to your staff without warning. They had no idea what they're walking into. Matter of fact, sometimes we give disinformation. You could be walking into a complaint or something, suddenly morphed in, suddenly spontaneously came something else. And your people were trained and given the opportunity to think on their feet legally, lawfully, and morally, and respond in the manner that you expect from a professional security profession. Um, and that is the reality-based training we spoke about. You heard me use the term RBT, reality-based training. So classroom work, yeah, it, it's good. But if you can get the extra component of this, it creates an environment of response to what you're speaking to, sir. Now, has this happened for police? Do police do scenario-based training? Yes. They do? Yes, okay. they what do. Is it, what does it look like? Very similar. Um, we call it like a Hogan's Alley, where certainly you have like literally a town or a village with shops and environments, props created. So it could be bars, it could be hotels, it could be residences where you're, you're drawn and, of course, the scope of your call would be, all right, you even have a radio set up where you, uh, you know, create the scenario where you have a radio call and you respond to a particular address. And there I'd speak to you know, Mr. Constantine and get information and something morphs. And by the way, you're not ramping up always for that 9-on-1 situation. It could be completely innocuous, completely low end. And by the way, you have the ability to change how that situation goes. If I'm able to talk a situation down, it never goes to the next step. And if I'm completely unawares, completely unawares where a person's hands are and what they do and something goes awry, then you can play back that video and play back to see what happened. You dropped your vigilance. You were completely distracted by something and here's where things went down. So about, but then you allow the adult the participant mm-hmm. to revisit that again to get a more of a beneficial experience. So yes, policing does that. Uh, we certainly did that with our, our basis training. And it's interesting, I think you agree, at the end of that training, that seemed to make the most impact mm. on our staff. And it's interesting because I've received emails from your client down the road saying, wow, there's a, there's a remarkable difference and there's an improvement. And there was a situation at one of your clients where a person attacked and an intermediate weapon, a baton had to be, had to be drawn. And the security guard actually said to me, because of that training, I was able to de-escalate the situation, and I didn't even have to use the baton. The fact that it was pulled, it was put out there saying, I will protect, that remedied it, and nobody was hurt. And he said, thank you very much, because that training worked. Wow. 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 So I didn't know about that. No, and, and Steve, I've actually been witness to, because uh, we, we uh, open up our, our training facilities for other entities if they want you know, space to get trained. I've seen people come up to you, mm-hmm. including ours, just kind of like they've gone through this <laughs> evangelical healing conference, right, where their minds have been kind of shifted. It's, it's an illumination yeah. of sorts, right? Yeah. yeah, where they've just been shifted. And to me, that's the powerful thing that I think is so important that people understand is that it's truly the change of thinking, right? And uh, Paradigm you know, shift. You know, yeah. 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 It's how, like how when we were in our 20s and we learned that you could you know, secure real estate with nothing down. It was exactly. Like, oh, are you kidding me? Exactly. Wait, and, <laughs> yeah. And, and, and to me, uh, well, I think your staff, you know, your friends, your colleagues, here, your team members have recognized it's not rhetoric. It's right. not political correctness. Yeah. This is real stuff that really, really does work. And you get good people providing the content. What I like about your people, they're fearless because they'll tell you if they think it's, it's workable or it's a piece of crap. Mm-hmm. They'll tell you. And they've been exposed to crap. They've seen this stuff. Are you kidding me? Uh, that's just a waste of my time. But mm-hmm. if a number of people come forward and say, yeah, this was remarkably different. This really changed the approach. I've, I've literally seen adults break down in tears as a result of a training mm-hmm. uh, process, which is unique. I have people very, very honestly come forward and say, thank you for that. That changed the way I, I view things. Mm-hmm. And I'm a believer, and this is what I'll do. Because I realize this is how I wish to manage myself and others. Well, and that's very, very beneficial. No, and, and not only that, but we tagged on something a couple of uh, minutes ago, which is the word empathy. Yes. Uh, based on, uh, on everything that we did, that word right now, empathy, in fact, I think, Steve, you coined it for us, empathy protectors. Yes. Uh, we, yeah. we right now, uh, that's something huge for us that we lead by in conversation right now. Right. Are you someone that can demonstrate empathy? You know, are you someone that can can 100% be able to uh, see the other side before right. you make your decision in an action. Right. And, and, and recognize the validity to want to. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and Yes, that's key. Yes, yeah, yeah. that's key. And you were talking about that earlier today. That's what your people do. You right. Know? Yeah. You know? And uh, that needs to be universal. I mean, forget, I mean, I, we've talked a little bit about law enforcement and security, but the, the amazing thing about your course 
and and your teaching is that it it could be applicable to all industries. Um, I mean, we could take out certain things that would be applicable only to law enforcement. Yeah, let me. Can yeah. I throw you a scenario? Throw please? me one, please, Mike. Okay. Oh yeah, throw you, and then you can pass it to Steve. <laughs> okay, so let's go. The double assist in hockey. Yeah. Teachers. Yes. Why do teachers need to know your program? Facets of your material, like just the student body. Sorry, the teacher, faculty, the yes. school boards out there in our city or other yeah. cities. It's a difficult job sometimes. I mean, it and is a difficult job, you know, and my heart goes out to them. Uh, our educators, educators of, uh, of our youth and the future leaders of our communities, future parents, they deal with a uh, myriad of challenges. And, of course, teachers are bound with a zero-touch policy, and I, I understand that. But the escalation requirements to be able to meet the stressors for our kids in the school system today much different than when I went to school. I mean, you know, thank God. And the, the melting the melting pot of so many different cultures you need to have uh, the ability to recognize adversity and stress and how to meet the needs of a young impressionable mind to be able to resonate and i had some teachers that made and fortunately i was too young at the time and didn't realize some high school teachers that made a difference in my life and i wish i could go back now and tell them thank you you know, mm -hmm. i wish right mm -hmm. At that time, I was too far too much driven by ego and my own self-worth that I, I really didn't recognize the value of some of these people, these professionals, these educators they had on me. But point being is to have the skills to recognize how to de-escalate and how to calm down and create that rapport with others. And it's just not a question to send them to the separate corners, but it's try to try to gauge the communications between and find that common ground between all where you don't allow a person to lose face you don't lose your honor you don't lose your you're not disrespecting anyone mm -hmm. nobody loses we always have a right to voice your opinion with rules with rules and you can certainly disagree with what i say and how i say it but we don't go to the violence component and i think that's important so yeah i have done workshops especially on the durham board of education a number of high schools where we're talking about the escalation training and we're talking about the management of resistant behavior and I'll be very honest with you, teachers, professionals have told me they haven't had any training like that. And thank you for that opportunity. I'd love to do that more. Okay. Can you give us an idea? Like, I mean, there's some alarming things. You don't think consider safety at work if you're not working in certain... I mean, like, you know it for police. Yeah. You think paramedics. Yeah. You think people in security. I was alarmed to find out not that many months ago that, uh, that nurses, you know, clinical staff, that nurses specifically are... What was the stat again? You know, that, uh, you know, police, that they're three times more likely to be assaulted on the job than police and cor corrections combined. Yeah, that's right. Okay. I have family members who are nurses. I would never think them being 120 pounds with this heart uh, to care for people. Yeah, that, love they, they, that they have a three times uh, more likely chance to be assaulted on the job. We've done so much work, the Ontario Nursing Association, and just a shout out to all of our first responders. And all those people are doing we just can't say no thanks, right? Especially yeah, during these sure. hard times. Yes. But I have had workshops, and I did recently a workshop down in Kingston General Hospital, and working with a lot of emergency nurses and nurses working strictly within the safe care facility, providing me hands-on workshop, basic self-defense. And, you know, when I say basic self-defense, that's according to people who have an idea what I'm talking about. I'm talking about somebody who's grabbed you by the, by the arm or by the hand or by your clothing or by your hair. Simple mm -hmm. escapes, simple means and methods to how to remove yourself from that environment and how to approach an individual or not and how to kind of read a personality as opposed to just their chart to find out what this person's starting to portray potential potential risk i've had 30 year senior veteran nurses come to me in tears thanking me for sharing the information that i've received in the medical career and i don't mind telling you i did a couple of those programs pro bono because i think that's where we need to pay back i wasn't down there for uh, for profit and make money I was so taken back by the warmth that came out there. And simple, what I thought is common sense. Never a view common sense as something everybody has because... Yeah, they say they, common sense isn't common. No, it's not, sir. <laughs> and I was so taken back by this, to how this was uh, embraced. And unfortunately, I dealt with a situation in a hospital in eastern Ontario where a nurse was almost killed by a patient. And uh, actually, I had to testify on behalf of the Ontario Nursing Association to demand to demand training and demand the presence of security to allow clinicians to work and they had no idea. And this involved a case where, you know, in good will and good spirit, a, um, a nurse was to take a patient down to the end of the, the hallway for, uh, to go to the washroom, but she didn't understand that the risk associated to the, that patient who had something sharp as a pen in her, in her hand and she, 
She stabbed the nurse 10 times in the neck. And if it wasn't Jeez. for her colleagues, she would have succumbed. She would have died. Oh, my goodness. And thank goodness for her colleagues quickly, you know, missed her some, some area of self-defense or, not, excuse me, uh, emergency critical aid yeah. and saved her. But, uh, yeah, it was just the basis of that. So that's what morphed into that program. So we would like to do more of that. And, you know, just to allow people some basic requisite skills to how to get out of harm's way. And nobody gets hurt. Nobody gets hurt. Yeah, I mean, those skills could be applied anywhere. We talk about, you know, just home. Again, yeah, your home, yeah. uh, mm-hmm. walking to, you know, into an ATM late night, right. going to a parking garage. Lineups of the grocery store to wait to get in because of pandemic. Yeah. People pushing and shoving in lines, big box stores. Oh, yeah. 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 These are, we don't take, I'm, I'm not laughing at those, those no. issues. These are real situations where people's lives turn into blank because I wasn't expecting adversity and or violence to be exposed to me right now. Yes. And that's what Stay Safe is all about. Well, let me just say this, just as we wrap up, Steve. Uh, if anybody wanted to uh, better themselves as an entity or as an individual, uh, simply log on to staysafeip.com. Yeah, it's out there. We have a network. We have a, a means to get an hold of us. Have the interest to talk about your programs, talk about your needs. I'll use you guys as a reference source to say how to work for you and uh, not being partisan with that. If you like it, great. And just ask people to get out there, get knowledge, get a skilled trainer. You know, there's a lot, there's good trainers out there, but make certain you're acquiring their experience, the benefit of their experience and their skill sets. Make certain that you have a means of testing your people, testing your people, and make certain that your people are tested to make certain that they can perform at a level that you are counting on, not just for purpose of meeting the needs of the gig, but keeping safe, all people safe. We don't want anybody working on our, on our shift, getting hurt. That's right. And we don't want to give people a yes. false sense of security. There's nothing worse than a false sense of security than no security at all. That's and that's, you know that's good, we man. don't want good people being exposed to something that could be prevented. Now learning from the three little pigs, one yes. of my favorite stories: Here when the wolf comes, yes, not sticks. Sorry, not hay, not sticks, but bricks. Brick. Right, right. Are right. Those are, are those your closing words, Mike? Yeah. 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 That's <laughs> always all, that's all I'm good. That's all I'm good for today. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> deep, always deep commentary, yes. on Mike. Or, you know. <laughs> no, no. That, that, like, Mike, do you want to just go a little bit into that? Since you know, no, I mean, yeah, okay. that's for you. I well, took. Well, look, <laughs> I'll, I'll say this. For me, because the wolf will come. It will. It yeah. will. And and that's yeah. the thing. I think a lot of times people don't think it exists. Yeah, you know what true. I mean. It's true. Um, Just like the pandemic, <laughs> it will come to pass. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Look, Steve, I, I want to truly thank you for for coming down today. Uh, um, I mean, uh, I could say that even though that I thought I learned, I mean that I knew it all, but I learned even more today oh, from wow. from hearing from you. And uh, we're uh, excited to continue the journey of stay safe for our people. Thank you, guys. And uh, again, for those of you that are listening, this is something that is one hundred percent needed and. Uh, if I will do anything, I'll make sure it gets required. Oh, so, thank you. Uh, thank so, you for the opportunity exactly. of sharing message. Thank you for the opportunity of people who are maybe curious or are seeking some validated, you know, valid information. Just to say what we want to be look at and some sources. So I invite you just in closing the Public Service Health and Safety Association. If any private security companies out there have access to legal counsel, mm-hmm. get your lawyer's opinion. Just not when you're in trouble. But yes. Be proactive. Yes. Be preventative. That's a good idea. Speak to your insurance underwriter, your insurance broker. Ask them. If I have proven training, when I get a discount, you might be shocked at the response and the answer. Hmm. So, you know, and speak to the clients. What is the presumption of risk? Take those reasonable decisions. Make certain that you have a trainer that can support you, not only in the boardroom, but also in the courtroom. And uh, to all of our viewers, stay safe. And thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. I want to say to you, Steve, you have a program that it's so near and dear to you. It's definitely uh, taken from your experience. What's amazing about um, something like that when it's a labor of love and we've seen you firsthand. Uh, you know that this is your life it's something that you've made a life journey a life uh, a life work what was amazing for us is it is we kind of saw that even as much as you know about it you probably still don't really know how valuable it is because when you're this close to it and you have this close relation um you know it because you fashioned it you put it together but again you don't know what you don't know okay and i i actually i'm excited to kind of see where this takes you you know, that if we can help in any way, get your program out there, because more people need to know it. Um, I also, even for police, you are, uh, you know, former police. I am. You yes. have that experience. You know it from the inside. You can't solve a problem from outside. Okay. And I just, no. yeah. And I know that, as I was saying off the top, um, I encourage you just to, you know, if you need our help in any way, shape, or form to get it done. But there's t- definitely two sides there, as we were saying earlier, pro and against. Oh, yes. You know, that's right. And I know that, like, it's great to hear how you can empathize with both. That sometimes means you are a bridge to both of them, you know. 
That's and, our goal. That's yeah. what we need to do. Yeah, and I think that if anything, I love that we live in Toronto, and it's a city where we talk about these things and we address them. We don't have some of the deeply entrenched problems that America has. They don't. We don't. Like they, that's the truth. We're fortunate. Even there, though, there's areas of great gain and strides that we can make as as a community. And I just, uh, I actually think there's something really cool that could happen in our city. You know, being so multicultural, we have so many different facets, different people from. And if we can make it work here, then it can work anywhere. You know, Mike, the United yeah. Nations has identified Toronto as being one of the most diverse communities on the planet. We have over 200 languages and cultures in the GTA. That's incredible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. We speak 200 different languages. I barely speak one. Yeah. 200 <laughs> different languages. Yeah. My kids are, you know, bilingual. Yeah. But I'm not, I haven't got there yet. Yeah. But they, yeah. uh, it's just the ability to be able to interact with others and to show the rest of the world really how we can all get along. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, again, and then from a policing standpoint, you know, we're, you know, uh, I just believe that we're in a position to maybe solve some of these problems, to address them, to go in not so stiff-necked, not so righteous, and say, like, okay, let's look at our neighborhoods. What can we do? Let's look at the way we police. How can it change? And uh, and one handshake at a time. Yeah. yeah. That's there all it takes. Go. Yeah, absolutely. Cheers. Okay, you well, go. We'll, we'll shake when the we pandemic's will. done. Yes, okay, absolutely. <laughs> God bless you guys. Take care and stay safe. Yeah, awesome. Care. Thanks a lot, guys. Cheers. Have a good one. Peace. Make sure to drop by next week. Let's go. go, go, go. And don't forget to subscribe. Let's go. It's time to give a shout out to our sponsors. This podcast is brought to you by Sentinel Security Plus. For all your premium security needs, visit SentinelSecurityPlus.com. Sentinel